thank you for making time after an extremely long and intense uh, past two days of talks. Your message has consistently been that you are here to open up lines of communication to mm. avoid a military clash. But you just said China did not agree to open that militarily to military line of talks. Did Xi Jinping just say no? It's a work in progress. This is something that we need to do in the interests of both of our countries. That is not only to establish and reestablish and strengthen lines of communication across our government, which we have done, uh, starting with this trip, and I believe uh, visits to follow by a number of my colleagues and then Chinese officials coming to the United States, usually important if we're going to responsibly manage the relationship, if we're going to communicate clearly and try to avoid the competition that we have during any conflict. But an aspect of that that really is important is military to military. Mm -hmm. We don't have an agreement on that yet. It's something we're going to keep working. I made very clear to our Chinese counterparts the importance that we attach uh, to that, uh, something that is also profoundly in their interest because, again, we both agree that we want to, uh, at the very least, make sure that we don't inadvertently have right. a conflict because of miscommunication, because of uh, misunderstanding. So Xi Jinping didn't say absolutely not. It was no, this just a not a commitment. This is a work in progress. We're working on it. Will the defense chiefs at least talk to each other? Well, again, to be, to be seen, we've made clear that we think that's important, more than important, uh, imperative. Uh, I think the Chinese understand very well uh, because I made very clear where we're coming from on this, and we'll keep working it. During the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union had that hotline. Mm. Is that the kind of thing you're imagining? How would this kind of communication it's work? It's, it's less a hotline and more regular engagement, regular uh, communication, so that they understand what we're doing and not doing. We understand what they're doing and not doing. We have greater clarity on each other's intent in, in different places. And in particular, when we have um, incidents, like the incidents that we just had a couple of weeks ago with uh, mm -hmm. dr them driving their boats much too close to ours or their, their planes uh, flying in very dangerous ways near ours, that we have uh, a channel established uh, that we can go to uh, to um, deal with the problem. But that architecture just doesn't exist right now. Well, we of course have, have, have many ways to, to communicate with, with uh, the Chinese government. It's exactly what we're doing. And we're seeing that now uh, pick up in part as a result of this, this trip. It's fundamentally in our interest to, to, to do that. Um, but one aspect that, that remains is the military to military, and yeah. we'll keep pressing it. Do you assess that China is not committing because they benefit somehow from ambiguity, because it complicates the U.S. presence in the Pacific? Well, I don't want to speak for them uh, or attribute uh, anything to them. But you have a theory. Uh, uh, well, we, have some, uh, we know that they have some concerns, including uh, some of our sanctions, for example. Uh, that's On the a problem defense for them, chief. For example, which does not prevent at all uh, contact or communication between the uh, defense chief and Secretary Austin. So, again, this is something that we've um, uh, engaged on these past couple of days. Uh, China knows exactly where we're coming from, the importance that we attach to it, uh, why we think it's beneficial to both of us. And, as I said, we'll keep working it. Have you offered to lift the sanctions off of their defense secretary, their defense it's not, chief? It's not necessary because, again, uh, we're, they're perfectly able, we're perfectly able to have these contacts with uh, their defense chief. So that sounds like a no. That wasn't, that wasn't an offer. The, the other thing that you really emphasized was the need to talk about fentanyl, mm -hmm. which is killing Americans. That's right. Do you believe that the Chinese state can really turn that up and turn that down? Yes. Yes. We, we need to see. Uh, much greater cooperation when it comes to fentanyl. We've seen some of that in the past. In fact, a few years ago, China actually scheduled fentanyl, made it, uh, put it on a prohibited list. And one result of that was that uh, actually manufactured fentanyl that had been coming to the United States from China, that pretty much went to zero. What's happened since, though, is that the chemicals that can be used to make fentanyl, the so-called precursors, mm -hmm. those have been moving um, liberally to, to primarily to Mexico, where it gets turned into fentanyl, and then winds up in the United States. So part of the challenge is making sure that chemical manufacturers that are producing these precursors in China, and then in some cases inadvertently sending it to the wrong people in, in, in Mexico or other places, sometimes intentionally, deliberately, that's what's got to stop. I made very clear to, to China that this is an area where we want and need to see real cooperation. As you said, this is a crisis for us the number one killer of Americans age 18 to 49. 
fentanyl. Uh, so the best way to deal effectively with this problem across the board, we're working, of course, on, on dealing with demand in the United States. We're dealing with law enforcement um, with Mexico. We're dealing with putting um, technology on our borders to detect uh, fentanyl and other, um, and other synthetic opioids. But we also want to go to the source, and that is these precursor chemicals. I believe this is an area where the United States and China can and must work together. It's not about, point, it's not about pointing fingers. It's simply uh, finding a way to cooperate and to do it in a way that, for example, their companies um, uh, get information sharing so that they really know um, who they're dealing with on the other end, that we have better labeling, uh, that we have uh, these know your customer protocols so again uh, they know that uh, they're uh, not uh, sending this stuff to people who are going to use it to turn it into fentanyl and in the case of companies that um, are doing this intentionally deliberately then of course if we have information we want China to act on it. I've had lawmakers in the US say that this is done intentionally by the Chinese state. Do you believe that? So all I can tell you is this um, we've seen cooperation from them in the past, and that's made a difference. That halted, uh, more or less, over the last uh, few years. They have um, issues that they've raised that, to try to explain why they're not doing as much as they can. And they've complained or, about sanctions again. They've complained about sanctions. They've complained about the fact that they scheduled fentanyl, and we haven't. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we should do, regardless, is to schedule fentanyl. But that doesn't take the... Uh, the responsibility from them in working with us and cooperating. And as I, as, I, as I put it to them, this is an area where we can and should work together. And here's the other thing, Margaret. What's happened uh, in part is that our market in the United States horrifically has become saturated. Last year we seized, we seized um, enough fentanyl to kill every single American. So the cartels, the criminal enterprises that are engaged in this are trying to make markets in other places. We've seen fentanyl use go up dramatically in Canada to the north, in Mexico itself but also in other parts of um, uh, Central uh, Latin America, mm -hmm. and also in Europe, we're starting to see it, and in uh, Asia. That means that the demand on China from other countries, not just from us, to take effective action, I think is only going to grow. Or they're also seeing a financial benefit. Well, again, uh, that may be the case, but that's why we are sanctioning um, companies, uh, individuals, when we can find them. We are taking law enforcement action, and we've, made very, we've been very clear with China that we'll continue to take those actions to protect our people. For months now, uh, the Biden administration has been talking about uh, this restriction on outbound investment mm. um, for American companies into China, particularly regarding sensitive national security issues. Are you going to make any changes to that based on what you heard during these last two days? No, we've been on a, on a course um, when it comes to outward, uh, outbound investment. I'm not going to get uh, ahead of the news, but it's something that we're very actively working on. What I did do during this trip was to try to explain very clearly what we're doing and what we're not doing. What we're not doing is trying to hold China back economically uh, to contain it. Uh, what we're not doing is decoupling the economic relationship. That would be profoundly against our own interests. Secretary Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary, testified to this just a couple of weeks ago. She said it would be disastrous to decouple our economies economically. We benefit tremendously from trade and investment when it's fair when it's on the level. One of the things that uh, it was very important for me to do on this trip uh, was to um, advance concerns that our companies and workers have in China. But when it comes to particularly sensitive technology that China is using to advance its own very opaque nuclear weapons program, to build hypersonic missiles, to uh, create technology that can be used for repressive purposes, it's not in our interest to provide that to them or to sell that to them. Yeah. And similarly, when it comes to investments in enterprises, companies that may be engaged mm -hmm. in some of this or, may, or that may facilitate it, it's not in our interest to, to do that. So what I told um, our, our counterparts here is this is for us, as we've said, about building a very high fence around a very small piece of land. Mm -hmm. And that small piece of land has very sensitive technology that could be used against us. We're not going to let that happen. Did you raise the listening post in Cuba that was recently disclosed and you talked about? I did. I'm not going to characterize their response, but I told them that this is um, a, a serious concern for us. Mm -hmm. um, and How widespread is this in Latin so America? So we've, uh -huh. uh, we've been taking steps over the past couple of years, diplomatically, wherever we've seen uh, China trying to create that kind of presence, 
we've been in there pushing back uh, against it, and we've had some success in doing that. This is nothing new, mm -hmm. uh, but it is something of, of real concern. I was very clear about our concerns with, uh, with China, but regardless of that, uh, we've been going uh, around to various places where we see this kind of activity, uh, trying to put a stop to it. Did you get any commitment from Beijing to help push back against Kim Jong-un and his missile testing and his nuclear program? Uh, no commitment, but uh, I think China understands that um, the most destabilizing actor in the area is Kim Jong-un with uh, his repeated missile tests and possibly even a seventh nuclear test. Um, and here's what I told uh, our Chinese counterparts. We want their cooperation in trying to move Kim Jong-un away from all this testing of missiles and to a negotiating table to deal with the nuclear program, to deal with the missile program. But if they can't or won't use their influence with North Korea to do that, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then we have to continue to take steps along with Korea, along with Japan, to protect ourselves, to protect our allies. Uh, and these are steps that are not directed at China, including more de uh, defense assets right uh, in the region, uh, exercises, work together. The, not directed at China, but that China probably won't like. So our expectation is that China will find ways to use the influence it has with North Korea. Again, in the past, we've had some success uh, at, at doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but they need to recognize that if they don't or won't, for whatever reason, uh, then we have to take steps to defend ourselves. Did you raise that specifically oh, with I Xi did. Jinping? Uh, oh, yes. Ra well, raise that in detail with my two other uh, interlocutors, the uh, state counselor and the director for foreign policy, um, uh, and more, more generically with uh, Xi Jinping. We, had, we spent, huh, I think, something like eight hours in conversation with uh, the state counselor, foreign minister, about three and a half hours in conversation with um, Director uh, Wang Yi, and had about uh, maybe an hour or so with Xi Jinping. The, the conversation with, with, with President Xi was at a higher level, at a, you know, more 60,000 feet. We weren't getting in to some of these specific issues, but it was very important to have that conversation with him to, to share what we believed we needed to do in terms of the relationship, uh, how we need to deal with our differences, how we need to see if we can find ways to, uh, to cooperate more. And that starts with uh, this uh, engagement, the high-level communications, getting back to the agenda that actually President Xi and President Biden set when they met in Bali at the end of last year. You are the first Secretary of State to visit this country in five years. That's right. But given where the relationship is right now, can you imagine President Biden coming to China? Will that happen? Uh, never say never, but let, we've got to start with where we're, where we're starting from, which is getting back to sustained high-level engagement across the government. And I think, again, you're going to see that in the, uh, in the weeks ahead. I also invited my Chinese counterpart to come to the United States, and he agreed, so we'll find a time to do that. Um, and, of course, President Biden and President Xi have um, met many times before. Will they meet um, this fall? And, and there's the possibility of, of meeting this fall, including at the, uh, the APEC meetings that we're hosting in San Francisco at the end of the year. And what is it that you need to take home to Washington to make decisions about? Like, what made this trip worth it? Oh, uh, look, I think we were in a, in a place where the relationship was increasingly unstable. I think we've injected some greater stability into it. Uh, we now have uh, a trajectory on engagements across our respective governments. That's good because uh, diplomacy, talking, engaging is actually the best way to advance virtually all of the interests that, uh, uh, that we have that are in play in China, mm -hmm. both in terms of dealing with our very profound differences and also, as I said, seeing if we can find areas to cooperate, like on, like on fentanyl. Uh, we have some American citizens who are being detained here mm -hmm. or prevented from leaving. Well, if we're not engaged directly, uh, we're probably not going to resolve that problem. That's something I also spent some time on. So this is a process. It, it's not one trip. It's not one meeting. Uh, there are, the relationship is so complicated and so consequential that it takes a lot of work. And these are hard issues, hard problems. But you have to start somewhere. And I think we've made a better start or restart as a result of these couple of days with a lot more to follow. Did you get any commitment on those three wrongfully detained Americans? Uh, we have a commitment to continue to work um, hard on resolving 
uh, these cases. And for me, that's right up there. From the with, Chinese from, government? From, yes. And, and for me, that is job uh, number one when it comes to looking out for the security and the safety of Americans abroad, and notably those who are being um, arbitrarily detained. Mark Sudan's health in particular uh, is a worry. His mother has spoken to, to CBS and other news organizations. Yes, I'm, de I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. And that's exactly why I, I not only raised, but talked some length about the individual cases of the detained uh, Americans. Is, are we in a place, though, as two governments where you're negotiating or even talking about a prisoner release? Or is this we, just? Yes, we are. You are? We are. And there's progress? Uh, again, I, I don't want to get into the, uh, the details, but we are uh, very actively talking about that. Well, that would certainly be a breakthrough in the relationship to bring those Americans home. It would, regardless of anything else, be a, a very important and positive development, and we're working it intensely. Um, can I ask you just to button up on the, where we started this? Do you have any assessment as to why China wouldn't want more communication with the United States? How do they benefit? Oh, I think, and again, I can't speak for them. I don't uh, want to put words or ideas in their mouths and heads, but I think clearly the fact that we're here, that we had two uh, very lengthy, uh, but also I think uh, very candid, very detailed, and in a number of places, constructive conversations and talks, I think that's evidence that they do want that, just as we think it's important. The, there's agreement on the proposition that each of us has an obligation to responsibly manage this relationship. Uh, we agree on that because I think we each see it as in our own interest. There's another reason we agree on that. Um, there's a demand signal from countries around the world that we do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear that wherever I go. I know that, that China hears that. So I think they're being responsible that. But that also that. lessens the pressure on China when they at least make motions mm -hmm. to show that they are making a good faith effort towards diplomacy. That's what your critics would say, right? Sure. That, uh, that America's getting played. Listen, um, the only way we're going to be able to see and test whether we can actually make progress on the many areas of concern that we have with China, as well as the what opportunities there are to cooperate, is by engaging, mm -hmm. is by talking. It would be irresponsible not to do that. Um, it would be irresponsible in terms of those uh, suffering from the uh, horrific affliction of, uh, of fentanyl, irresponsible in terms of the detained Americans, um, irresponsible in terms of our workers uh, and businesses who are engaged here but in many ways are being treated badly or unfairly. Um, so not engaging is not going to get you any results. It's necessary, it's not always sufficient, but it's, it's necessary in order to actually advance and make progress. And for um, their own reasons. I think uh, Beijing understands that as well. That's why we've had these, uh, these meetings these past two days. It's also why I expect you'll see uh, more to come. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is this, Margaret. Um, my job, our jobs, are to defend and advance the interests of, uh, of our country and our fellow Americans. And we believe that one way to do that, a usually important way to do that, is through engagement, is through diplomacy, is through talking. Last thing. We come at this from a position of strength. Um, two and a half years ago, we, the president made uh, two major decisions. One was to reinvest in America. And as a result of these historic investments, uh, infrastructure, uh, technology, the CHIPS Act, um, research and development, the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we are much stronger at home and much more competitive. Second. We reinvested in, in our alliances, our partnerships. We re-energized them. We re-engaged them. And one product of that is we have much greater alignment with key partners and allies in Europe and in Asia about how to approach China. Mm -hmm. So our strength at home, our standing in the world, much improved. And that's very good when it comes to dealing with the challenges posed by China. Did um, Vladimir Putin come up? Oh, yes. The partnership without limits? Are there any limits on that? What, what came up was, of course, the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. And our hope that um, if there's an opportunity, uh, China can be um, helpful, productive, positive in, um, in helping to bring the aggression to an end. Mm -hmm. And we've actually uh, said that we've, 
welcome some of the things that, uh, that they've done, including the fact that uh, President Xi spoke to uh, President Zelensky, statements that China's made about the use of nuclear weapons, very important, uh, as well as some of the ideas that were in the peace proposal that, that they put out. Not everything's good, but there are important elements, including uh, what they say is critical, which is upholding the territorial integrity and sovereignty of countries. So there may be a point where um, China can play a, a positive, uh, constructive role in this. It's something we talked about. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your time. Good to be with you. I appreciate it. Thank you.